So we just finished recording today's podcast with Jeff Cox, who is the founder and CEO of Simply Benefits here in Kelowna, which is an insurance company um, and a tech company. This conversation was one of the most illuminating that we have had to date on the Wealthy Podcast because we delve into a really, really important area of healthcare that is rarely discussed in conversations like these. Jeff helps us deconstruct how healthcare funding and benefits work in Canada, including MSP, including employee benefits. And we also get into a little bit about what we can do as individuals to support our healthcare journeys. This is a podcast episode you don't want to miss. It has benefit for everyone, no pun intended. So on today's episode of The Wealthy Podcast, I'm really excited to welcome Jeff Cox. And I think, actually, after reflecting on the conversation that we're about to have, this is probably one of the most important episodes that we have recorded. And it's not because Jeff is a doctor or a clinician, and he's not here to share strategies on what you should be eating and what you shouldn't be eating. Um, And he's not here to unpack the complexities of mental well-being or optimizing hormonal health. Jeff is here to talk with me about insurance. Um, because although Canada is celebrated often for its commitment to universal health care, as many of us who have navigated the healthcare system know, there are many, many, some would say vital health services not covered by MSP, and the complexities of insurance uh, and insurance plans and drug plans and coverage can be really overwhelming to sort out, especially when you are also navigating a health crisis. So the great news is, is that Jeff is here today to unpack these things, I hope, even for me, because I will admit I am very ignorant on this subject, um, so that in the event that this becomes a concern for you or someone you love, you have a little bit more information or a resource uh, or some knowledge of what may be about to take place. So I'm really pleased to welcome Jeff. Jeff is the CEO and founder of Simply Benefits in Kelowna, BC. Many uh, who live in this community are familiar with Jeff. He's a regular contributor on uh, a local morning show here in Kelowna. Um, He is a a wealth of knowledge and an interesting personality. Uh, and I'm super excited to welcome Jeff here today to the Wealthy Podcast. Thanks for having me. That's a high bar. We'll try my best. <laughs> I pride myself on my intros. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a podcast, <clears throat> but I really love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> so um, I learned, actually, um, that you, although you work in insurance, mm-hmm. you come from a very... Um, well entrenched history of healthcare in your family yep. and with your relations. Do you want to <laughs> kind of share? I, I know it's not on my list, but like Jason, our producer, um, knows Jeff well and was just sharing a little bit. And I thought that is that's probably why you're the perfect guest to talk about this. So maybe you can share a little bit about that. Well, I definitely have healthcare practitioners all around me, um, immediate family that are that are either in nursing or or have moved on from that to work in administration and practice. So I, I have a pretty good understanding of the public health care system based on that, or at least the, that bent, um, and then have been a consultant prior to forming Simply Benefits. So I understand the private health care component of, of, of Canada as well. Um, and so I think it, it at least gives me, at least in my own head, a conceptualization <laughs> of, of how the system works, which <clears throat> I agree with you. I mean, I think there's approximately 30, 30 countries that have universal health care in the world, and we obviously are one of them. Um, and and it, it's understanding what that means, because that seems to be the challenge for a lot of people, 
and you did touch on it. So we, no matter what you're talking about in healthcare, Canada, which is then passed down to the provinces, is has to be first payer. That's the way the law reads. If if so, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Healthcare in Canada is universal. The the provincial governments become first payer on anything that exists within healthcare. If it's not covered through a medical services plan, then it gets pushed to a second or third payer, which is where most people don't. That's that tends to be the first breakdown. Is that universal healthcare covers everything, no matter no matter if you've ever had a bill paid or not. That is that is the way it, the healthcare act reads, and then from there it gets pushed to second, and in in lots of cases third payers. Um, in in the industry, which people know as Manulife, Sun Life, like the insurance Equitable, providers, correct? The insurance yeah. providers, and then government plans. So if you're Indigenous, you you also have participation in things like NHIB, um, uh, disability management um, has third payer components to it as well, depending on on you know if you're in a program that's run by the government. So there are multiple levels to this and it, and it becomes quite complicated for most people. It's complicated for me and I'm in the industry. Yeah. And I think that's, I, I love that you're starting <clears throat> there because I think that's where most of us get stopped up is, and, and, and we even see it too in terms of um, the understanding of how funding works in yep. Canada, healthcare funding works in Canada. Um Kind of on the other side, that's why the KGH Foundation exists, yeah, yeah. because even though we have universal health care, the commitment is to a basic standard of care, and there are gaps. And yep. so when you say first payer, yep. can you, like, what sure. does that mean? I mean, I think I know, but I don't want to assume. <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a yeah, good question. Yeah. So there's a specific, um, and it goes province by province. So I'll use BC, because yeah. that's, that's where we're located. So. If you were to take something, um, take a take a take a drug. Yeah. You are you are being prescribed a drug by your doctor, um, and and you go to the pharmacist to you go to a pharmacy and the pharmacist fulfills that 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 drug that's been prescribed to you. What you show up with your insurance card, and what actually happens before it goes to private insurance is it's ran through our Fair Pharma Care program here in British Columbia. If that if you qualify, so if the drug is on the list of drugs provided by the province, you need to hit a deductible, which in 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 almost all of Canada is based on income. So it's an income test where you fall within your income um, defines your deductible. The, right. So it runs through there. It doesn't get paid on the first round, and it gets pushed to your 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 private payer, which could be simply benefits. It could be Manulife, Life, and then it runs through. <clears throat> you will hit a stage where if it's a maintenance drug and it's and it's thousands of dollars, you will eventually hit a deductible, which will then have Pharmacare pick that that drug up. And so that drug will be paid by by the government before it gets pushed to your private plan. So that that's probably the most common example that we would see. Right. Now the income test for most people that go to work and 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 especially have dual income means that pharmacare most likely won't pick that drug up. Right. Okay. But you so it's an income <clears throat> threshold. It's an income threshold. Got now it. the ch the challenge being that we default to the lowest <clears throat> to the lowest deductible and we and we don't so so although most people may not see that drug get picked up by the province, it'll always be paid by their private paying plan. Um, you have to you have to apply for pharmacare and be part of the pharmacare program at the lowest deductible. And so that's where people first of all get frustrated. Well, I'm right. never this you know, why do I need to do this? You need to do this because it's part of our socialized medical system. Right. But that seems to be challenge number 1 is is just the understanding of how that works. If you're in British Columbia, um and and again, this is now you get into the business of this. In British Columbia, the the healthcare rate that are that are for private healthcare paid by an employer is forty percent less than Ontario and Alberta because in British Columbia we run a fair pharma care program. Oh, I see. Okay. In Ontario, they run a program called Trillium, which is a bit of a catch basin for some catastrophic drugs, but doesn't come remotely close to to the significance that the, of the Fair Pharma Care program that's ran in British Columbia. So, so in your opinion, is that program uh, offering better benefit then for 
people in this province versus maybe some other provinces in Canada? <clears throat> I mean, the like on the surface, yes, it okay. is. <laughs> yeah, I well, <clears throat> it is because um, you know we we you for a group of people more more are are going to get covered. So you're going to have less struggle for low income housing for for people in low the inc- low income bracket seniors, which is actually the place that we see it probably hit the most. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, from a, from a social standpoint, it makes sense. And, it, and if you think about it, uh, it does lower the cost for employers. Now, the offset to that is we also charge, uh, where there was a shift in the last few years where we don't pay MSP premiums anymore as individuals. A lot of businesses paid those on behalf of individuals, but not all. Um, and the reality is if you weren't employed, you were responsible for that. Again, it was an income test. That's totally been shifted now to employer paid. And again, it's actually based on size of employer. Um, small businesses tend tend to not pay into it because it's based on it's based on your payroll. And then it progresses from there. So it's shifted the cost to to medium and large size businesses. I see. Um, so it's a little, you know, although although the cost of an of a plan may be less, um, they're picking the cost up on the other side because they're now they're now the ones paying our MSP premiums. And so uh, you mentioned this a couple of times, and then uh, touched on kind of more vulnerable populations such as seniors. Um, what what about people that uh, work for a smaller business uh, or an employer that doesn't have like that plan yep. in place is do they then in order to fully be covered let's say mm-hmm. to the to the to the best of the system's ability um or optimize coverage has, would it be recommended that they seek out like a an extended benefits provider like separately, like simply benefits. I work for an employer that covers that stuff, yep. so I don't, I don't know. But I imagine there are a number of people out there that don't have, that don't have that. Less and less, to be honest okay, with you, good. it's it's almost become a, it's almost become the norm. It, especially we saw the pressures that happened during COVID and the ability to attract staff. I mean, to operate without a benefits plan today is is hard. It's very rare that we run into groups that, that are, if you form a business that aren't covered, even down to two lives. Um, but they do exist. Again, this, this becomes part of the question, you know, how do you do that as an individual? You, you can buy individual plans. Um, they don't compare to a, to an employer driven plan. And, and really what you see is if people are in need of those plans, it's typically a big question when they're asking about their employment. Do you have a, do you have a health plan? For we, sure. we know that, that it it's a when people weigh um, the jobs that they're taking that that typically is number two right behind what is my what is my salary mm-hmm. so that's you know that becomes more the shift is that people that are in need of a, a plan because they have young kids or because they're you know they have a medical condition that that's ongoing um, they tend to gravitate to jobs that that fulfill those roles. You'll see it in young companies or companies that are very youthful um, where they shift to things like you know, either no plan or it's coming or they've incentivized them another way. Um, and I think we're going to talk about that, things like health spending accounts. And, yes. And yeah. Of that nature, so. Well, and, and the reason that I ask is because um, before <laughs> I worked here, I um, was a, a full time mom for a little while, which was a very awesome and difficult job. Um, and my husband was the primary earner in our home and he's a realtor. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of one of those people that, I mean, he has his own business now. Now he does have a, a, a plan, but for many, many years did not. So when I started working here, that was a huge part. Like you said, the part of the consideration was that there was a benefits plan. Um, and thank you for kind of unpacking that. I don't think I am alone in being completely mystified by all of this stuff. And and I guess the point is that it's okay. Uh, we always say like healthcare doesn't matter until it does. Yeah. And then it's the only thing that matters. Yeah. And this is another one of those topics. Yeah, for sure. So um, I did want to talk about health spending accounts, but I'm going to save that sure. because in preparation for this, I had sent you over some questions and you said, those are great, but what about <laughs> these questions? 
which is like, again, just an indication of my complete ignorance on the subject. Um, but I really am grateful for that feedback because you probably experience this on a daily basis, the most common questions or obstacles that people run up against yep. when it comes to questions around coverage and why is this drug covered and why is that not this drug? And I think that's probably the most common one. So can you unpack that one a little bit when it comes to um, like, like drug coverage? Yep. I've heard this a lot, mostly from, I'll call them end users, people that are struggling maybe they have an advanced cancer diagnosis and their drug is covered but it's only covered for a year yeah are you able to sort of shed some light onto how that all works and why what like what the rules are and the thresholds are yeah definitely so you again the you have a couple key factors in this in british columbia cancer drugs are picked up by the province we almost never see them hit a plan so so in that scenario typically they're being paid paid first payer by the province. And typically they're from dollar zero. So you don't have to hit a deductible. Now that depends on if it's a prescribed drug that you're walking away from the clinic um, to take. Um, that is a situation that can be different. You, <clears throat> When you're looking at a drug uh, from, from an employer plan, so from a, from a second payer plan or a private plan, you have a couple f- functions of it. The majority of plans uh, in Canada work under what we call mandatory subgeneric. So it's a, if it's been approved by Health Canada, um, they will pay for that drug. If there's a generic equivalent, they will pay for the generic equivalent. Uh, people get a little bit frustrated with that. But the medical ingredients... Are they the same? I mean, I, I'm not a pharmacist or a doctor, okay, but I would right. say this. The, the assumption <clears throat> is they're the, the same. The medical ingredient in a standard drug has to be the same in a generic. When you move to things like biosimilars or biologics and biosimilars, that's typically not the case because it's not possible but but it's close enough that there's a there's a push and a need f- to do that so you get into things like the, what we call the efficacy of a drug so if a drug works the same and does the same result we would push for the lowest cost alternative mm. and, and when i say we just the generalization of the industry drugs are the highest cost they make up 70 percent of the cost of healthcare plans really so the pressure to to reduce those costs at at any cost um, is 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 first and foremost for most insurers and most provinces. So what happens is you a drug. So again, let's say a drug you walk in and a drug is not covered, um, although you have a private plan. Two things have happened, uh, or or multiple, but the two big factors are it's not part of the formulary that that's been chosen by your employer. So again, I go back to it. They may have chosen a formulary that's different than uh, one that's covered by this drug. And there can be lots of reasons. It's not malicious. It's cost becomes a big factor. Um, What's the formulary? Yeah, so if, it's a good, good question. Talk sorry, to I'm me making, like I'm on uh, grade one. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's so okay. A formulary is a list of drugs. Got it. So uh, like I said, the, the province in British Columbia has a list of drugs that, that fluctuates daily. And I think today it's around 6,000. And if you put that against an open formulary, drugs approved in Canada, it's about 15,000. Okay. So that's a big gap, right? Um, so if you have an employer that chooses to match uh, a BC formulary, then there's going to be a gap in those drugs. So that could be one reason your drug is not covered. Ah, see? <clears throat> that makes... Thank you. That makes so much sense. The second reason that a drug may not be paid initially is because it's been... Um, essentially there's medical evidence to say that there's other drugs that may work before you get to this drug. And we refer to that as step therapy or prior authorization. Have you tried these three things before we get to Remicade or before we get to a drug to treat any disease state? Typically a drug that's high cost of maintenance has step therapy attached to it. So, so, and people find this frustrating and I understand that component of it. What if they wanted to put the lens on on the other side is if a drug, if you can, if you can uh, treat um, the symptoms of a disease with a drug that costs $600 versus a drug that costs $6,000, you would take that drug. And I understand the frustration because they get prescribed by the doctor saying, right. you know, this is probably what you need. And they're like, Hey, this is important to me and I'm going through pain or, or a family member is going through pain. So that becomes frustrating for users, mm-hmm. but that's just the reality of, of, of our healthcare system. That's mm-hmm. the way it works. Mm-hmm. 
And, and so those are two, those are the two typical reasons that we see people say, I don't understand why my drug's not covered. I have an insurance plan. And it's typically one of those two things. It's not listed under that plan or, and, or, um, and, or, you know, there's, there's steps they need to take before they get there. And who, um, I'm just curious, I would, this would be the question I would ask, like that, that those steps yep. are determined by like a standard of care like who gets to make the rules yeah yeah yeah. they're 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 i mean they're set by the insurers in this in the position of second payer and and again they're not they're not um i think it's very important to understand that they're not playing with people's health it's a it's a very standard principled approach that exists that involves nurses and doctors that say have we done these things before we get to this stage? Mm-hmm. And and that's really what they're doing. They're not saying no. They're just saying we have to ensure that these three things were done before we're willing to pay fifty five thousand dollars a year for a drug. Right. And so the lens obviously is what's going to or what has proven to be successful for Correct. patients that are facing the same similar diagnosis or prognosis. Yep. And what's going to have the least amount of impact let's say financially on the system that's really the two factors that yeah come into it yeah. right and what if um is there any uh I'm, and i and i i know this is probably like you know one of those stickier questions but if there's a dispute you know if somebody's like <laughs> it's a valid just question. like oh really you know i mean like what what yeah what I, what what can people do and what kind of outcomes can they expect from that? And I, and I think this is where people get frustrated, yeah. right? And so they end up back at their doctor. Ultimately, I would say the patient or the user ultimately 99.9% of the time ends up winning and that's the wrong word to use. But ultimately, the drug usually gets paid. An employer can get involved. They're, they're going to have advocates like doctors, specialists that are going to step in and say, hey, listen, this is a we have to do this. And so most of the time, that's the case. Listen, I, I firmly believe this. I have worked in this industry for a long time. I understand people's frustration. I don't think insurers get up in the morning with the intention of denying claims. I really don't. Right. I know okay. that is the I know that is the way it gets proposed, but I see this happen daily. That's that's not that's that's fictitious to a degree. It's a little bit American style healthcare. Um, that does not exist here. We, there are there are a lot of rules and regulations, mostly because we have a universal healthcare system right. around the deliverables. Of, of of things like drugs. So um, although there are frustrating moments through this process, the reality is that that is that really doesn't exist in Canada like it's perceived to be. Um, and I would suggest it's really driven from from an American system. Well, and, and part of it is that there's a responsibility to be good stewards of the taxpayers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dollars, <laughs> yeah. From a from a provincial standpoint, you're right. Uh, and that was theoretically the, that was the put the push around biosimilars, which a lot of people were up in arms about. Um, so What's to, a biosimilar? So when you get into complex drugs like um, biologics, right? So um, these are compound drugs. They're, they're living organism drugs. Uh, again, I'm not a doctor or pharmacist, but yep. so you're talking about complicated drugs that treat complicated disease states. There are the generic form of, of, of biologics that are we call biosimilars, and they come at a significantly reduced cost. And, the, and, and again, because you're not talking about a medical ingredient, and again, this becomes quite complicated about how drugs, how, how you create a drug, but the biosimilars um, have, a, have to have a different approach than just using a medical ingredient after it comes off patent. Right. So so that was the big push around biosimilars. But again, we saw other universal healthcare countries, um, specifically in, in, in Europe, adopt it and have success. And that was the reason that it was adopted in British Columbia. And and from my perspective, it's not been a challenge since. Mm. There's there's always pushback when change happens, right? Um, so So, you know, this is the complexity that exists that no one talks about on a day-to-day basis mm-hmm. um, when it comes to delivering healthcare in a, in a in any country, but in a country that has a, a multiple payer system. Yeah, and it is. I mean, to your point, it is <clears throat> it is complicated, and I think that um, I think it's so unfortunate that most of us just sort of wander around in blissful ignorance until something happens, yep. um, and then it becomes really. Mm-hmm. 
uh, stressful. I, you know, I think the other thing to highlight too is that we as Canadians, I don't think we take health care for granted because I, I don't think that's a fair statement, but we believe health care to be a right. And I don't disagree with that. I, I'm a firm believer in the universal health care system. That being said, I don't think most people understand the burden that hits employers to have health care programs in place. Interesting. So, you know, you're probably on average talking about Again, if you're in British Columbia, Ontario, it's different, but you're talking about six to ten thousand dollars per employee in in healthcare costs um, that are that are being absorbed by the employer. And then in British Columbia, you, if you're a larger employer, you're also talking about up to two percent, two and a half percent of your payroll that's going to pay the MSP premiums as well. Right. So you're talking about a significant amount of money that's being burdened by an employer that's actually not really getting a lot of credit for what they've, what they, what they're, how much they're participating in this, mm-hmm. in this scenario. So when people get frustrated to say like, you know, my plan's not good enough. It's like, well, the intention of healthcare or, re- or the intention of insurance is that, you know, everyone pays in and very few claim we've moved. And again, this comes to the things like healthcare spending accounts. We've moved away from that model to, to, I need to take them. I, you know, my healthcare benefit is, is something that I need to be utilizing all the time. And that works very totally. it, and I don't disagree with that either, but it just drives costs up, right? And and so it's a it's a tightrope. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for for employers, it's a it's a tightrope if you're a consultant and you're trying to do what's best for the employer and the employee. Um, and and then mix in, you know, a constantly changing um, universal healthcare plan that exists in Canada. I am happy that you highlighted that. I do think that the benefits package, once you've sort of signed the papers and all goes away, you have the job, we do take it for granted a little bit. Um, and I certainly am guilty of that for sure. And, and uh, you know, as I'm trying to get a massage appointment uh, at the end of the year and they're like, well, sorry, everybody's trying to <clears throat> use up their benefits. You know, I... I hear, I hear what you're saying that that comes at a cost. It does, right? Yeah. It's not just um, there's always a cost to a benefit, right? Um, so, it, so we've sort of touched, just mm-hmm. scratched a little bit at the health spending account. Mm-hmm. So this has come up a couple of times uh, in regards to some of the topics that we or guests that we've had on this podcast yep. that operate. Um, health programs or services that are, uh, I guess what you would call alternative modalities, but they sit outside of um, that suite of services that is covered by MSP and yeah. and even most extended benefits programs. Things like um, ketamine treatment for um, <clears throat> treatment resistant depression, yep. um, dietitians um, in some cases. So so the health spending account ca- has come up. Um, h- hormone treatment or integrate- integrated treatment for um, p- women or even men in midlife that are sort of trying to, to manage the changes that are happening there, um, not covered. So, so can you define what a health spending account is, what, yeah. the, what the context of access is, um, and the benefit to it. Yep. Yeah. So, and they're all great, great questions about how it all works. A health spending account, uh, not to be mistaken with a lifestyle spending account or a wellness spending account, because okay. there's, there's differences. What's the difference? So a health spending account, we would define as something to cover off medically necessary treatments. Um, defined by CRA as a medically necessary treatment. A lifestyles account or a wellness account is in the lines of um, things like gym memberships or yoga or... Now, that line is not black or white um, of what you consider medically necessary and what what you consider to be a well... You know, more of a lifestyles account. Lifestyles account or wellness accounts are taxable benefits. So it's no different than getting a dollar pay for for going to work. A lifestyles account or wellness account are going to be taxed like you're being compensated. A health spending account is is a tax-free benefit, very similar to your benefits. So they're defined by the employer 
um, as a, they were started as a flex option as part of your plan. So here's your plan, here's your core benefits. And by the way, here's a thousand dollars or $500 or $1,500 to spend how you want in your, in, in your medical needs. Um, and that, that was how they were driven. They work. The reason, the, the reason you can't use them as an individual or the reason there's no tax like you can't go out and be like hey jeff can can you make me a make me one of these yeah (laughs) the reason that doesn't work is because because you're using after you would be funding it with after tax dollars right and you would be effectively paying an adjudication fee to to have someone look at it to say yes that's medically necessary uh need and you would actually be further behind because you would be paying the dollar that you spent plus the adjudication fee and you might as well just pay it out of pocket. Right, okay. The reason health spending accounts work, and and again, you get into this medically necessary component, is is you're using corporate, you're using corporate dollars, pre-tax corporate dollars to fund this. So now you get into the, you know, Canadian tax code and, 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 and what the government has said is here's an incentive to provide these benefits to your workers, right? And this no different than your benefits plan. It's the same thing. It's a it's 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 not subject to the t- to the tax funnel that exists to get a dollar out if you're an if you're an employee or employer, right? So that's why they work. Employers can fund them with 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 essentially pre tax dollars, and they allow you to have a benefit um, that you're not being taxed on, right? Um, and it's fairly open. Yeah. As it's long as it's on the list of CRA approved medically yeah. necessary. <clears throat> Which has gotten treatment. a lot tighter in the last <laughs> in the last kind of 5 or 6 years. That that and we've seen this kind of tighten up of the of of what is what you can get away with mm-hmm. um go, going into these accounts. Do you have an example of some of the medically what do you call them? Nece- medically necessary. Medi- medically yeah. necessary. I mean, the standard the standard ones that you see are things like you know physiochiro massage, obviously okay. pretty basics covered by plan. So let's say that that you were given five hundred dollars per practitioner in your in your traditional plan, and the reality is you know you use all your chiropractor massage up by March. You then can you then shift some, those coverages to that. Yeah. Um, if you have a coinsurance on your drugs of eighty percent, and you walk into a to a pharmacy, and it's like, well, you're going to pay twenty five dollars out of pocket. You can use that twenty five dollars can nice. get pushed to your health spending account. Got it. Um, you know, CPAP supplies uh, that that you know may not may only be you know you might only get a mask every twelve months based on based on your based on your plan, but but for whatever reason you need it six months. Same same in dental, maybe. Maybe you have a coinsurance on basic dental um, that 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 you you can run through a health spending account. So they're typically done for for those reasons. Um, and then you have wellness or lifestyle accounts, which are more along the lines of of the proactive components mm. of it. Which is uh, we really started to see those put in place for things like you know mostly to pay for things like sports or gym memberships um, as, as were suggested. But we've actually watched that broaden mm-hmm. um, to things like running shoes or pretty much any promotion of, of, a, of, of health. Of health. Yeah. 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 So we've, in, in, you know, in the, or in the tech space, I mean, it's, it's a little softened a little bit. If you go back three or four years, we saw that, you know, tech tends to be in the lead edge of compensation, right? It's the, it was the home of pizza parties and ping pong tables. Right. Yeah. That's kind of gone to the wayside as people said, this that's not really a benefit for me anymore. Right. No. And so we started to see these kind of progressive approaches. So, you know, when everybody went home for for the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, we started to see people say, like, you know what? We're gonna allocate uh groceries as part of a, a, a lifestyles account. Mm. So um again, taxable benefit. It's 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 going to hit you from a tax perspective. If you were making $50,000 a year and you were allocated $1,000 and you used it, you're now paying taxes on $51,000. Okay. But what it does is it gives incentives and and it, it does. I, I believe people feel like, hey, that's I'm my work is promoting me to do these things. And so it allows compensation um, within, within the rails, right? I'm just not giving a dollar. I'm, um, I'm, 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 I'm reimbursing you for things you're already doing, and we we know that there's a there is um, 
there is an attachment that employees have to that. So so that lasts a lot longer than a raise. Um, right. We we know we know that psychologically exists. And to your point, like the you know, I'm sure there's a term for this, uh, but even just sort of anecdotally relating back to the fact that you have this like you have this account, this cre- yep. let's call it a credit. Um you're more inclined to use it. Like even if you're you know, a lot of what we're trying to do with this podcast is to not only sort of shine light on, you know, acute care treatments, um, recovery, all of that, but but also health promotion. Yep. Right. So I think that it's interesting because it exists also in the insurance <clears throat> space, and I'm I'm happy to hear that it does. The idea being, obviously, if we, if if we as employers can consider this as an as an option to help attract instead of pizza parties and ping pong tables yeah. to help attract talent to our organizations, saying you know we are investing in health prevention and promotion through this particular. I mean, I get it on the tax side of things. It's, um, but. The fact that it exists, I think, would be an incentive to use it. Agreed. Right? I I don't think most, I would say, especially when you, like, listen, the core benefits are the core benefits. And if you get diagnosed uh, with a disease and you go into your doctor and they say, here's a drug and you have to get it and it's, and it's paid for and, and that's the way life goes. I think when you get into the ancillary benefits, which, which is what we're talking about, um, there is a significant underutilization, although, in, and to your point, th- this is, I deal with this every day. Employers, most employers, and the, and, and frankly, the ones that are not bought in are probably not going to be fits of, of yeah. clients of ours. But the reality is most are out to do things. They're trying to improve the wellness of their employees. There's, I mean, there's so much data to support the Correct. fact that healthy employees are good employees yeah 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 you know they're 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 easy to deal with they show up for work you know they, they're more productive and so that was that is the push from an employer perspective to do these things right mm-hmm. but we see you know not just hsas you, you know employee family assistance programs which most people i think default to for only in a time of need which the reality is most of those programs have 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 robust resources to talk about. I'm having tr- trouble with my 12 year old or my 14 year old. Right. Or, I lost my grandmother, and I, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, or even basic stuff like like we're having finance issues. Right. A lot of employee and family assistance programs offer resources around those things. You know, I'm I'm separated, going through a divorce. Now, don't get me wrong. You, there, at some point, that can't be covered by an an EFAP program, but at the same time, there are there are initial resources that help people go the right direction. That area we see to be significantly underutilized. Interesting. <clears throat> There's only about 11% on average of people that participate in an EFAP program. You, you see a shift too to things like, and this is debatable, especially I, I would say here, um, because it kind of goes against our universal healthcare program, but virtual healthcare. So the ability to see a doctor has become part of benefits plans at about an average of 20%. So employers purchasing a private virtual healthcare program where an employee can pick the phone, but essentially go on a go on a Zoom call and talk to a doctor outside of our medical system. Okay, what? And this is a- Is this, this a thing? Yeah, 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 all the time. And in, and, in, and in British Columbia, there's free virtual healthcare. So it's had less pickup. But again, if you move into places like Alberta or Ontario, uh, we've seen virtual healthcare um, take off, where it's almost di- like instant access to a doctor or a nurse practitioner that can prescribe and push you to the next step within your health journey. You're blowing my mind right now. Yeah, and 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 it's not, and it's also not really loved by current governments because it really goes against the idea that like you're all the relational like, aspect of I'm not I'm not against it. I'm just I'm I'm just laying out here's the challenges. So we've seen a lot of pushback from government saying you can't do that. This is that's that's a private system. Now the other side is well then give we have two hundred thousand people that don't have that don't have a family doctor. So they can't push too hard right now because there's there's the, the challenges. So you're gonna leave people out in the cold. And and this is the 
this is the, the game that we play and the complexity we play all the time. But, but really proactive employers are looking at these options and saying, I'm not just going to cover uh, a traditional plan. We're going to look at adding things like elder care. So, so you know, there, there are components of plans now that are focused on people that are taking care of their parents. Um, it's so interesting that you bring that up because we've, you know, I mean, the KGH Foundation is a, I think, small to medium size, mm-hmm. 30 eight mm-hmm. employees at last count. Um, but this is coming up with the, the elder care piece. And, and so you're saying that you can now create accommodations within your benefits plan for employees to be able to take care of a sick parent or yep. an aging parent. Yeah. So it'd be part of a, part of an employee family assistance program that is, that's complex that says, oh yeah, we have a component and it's and it's paid for that's part of elder care. And so it could be short-term solutions for private duty nursing at home or or helping them transition into a into a care facility. Oh, okay. And it's usually done by a dollar amount. So, you know, there's five thousand dollars allocated to this or ten thousand dollars allocated to that. And it's again, it's a bridge for employees that are that are struggling with parents and and again, it goes right back to it. So if an employee is struggling with a parent, they're most likely not focused at work. So if you can get the challenges of those employees out of the way, which is where our benefits plan has gone, okay, mm-hmm. what, am, what challenges are my employees facing and how do I remove those challenges so that they can focus on doing their job? And that, that's that been the shift we've seen um, with these, what I refer to as kind of like fringe or ancillary benefits. Mm-hmm. And, and the list is long, you know. Um, we also see... This this idea of um, of you know Telus has actually taken a really big stance in this, but but what is uh, n- what we're known as like executive medicals, but really have moved to private medicals. So once a year, not in our healthcare system, outside of our healthcare system, everyone is allocated a four hour uh, meeting with a private doctor to talk about you know their eating and possibly do um, things that they can't get access to in the public system. Again, it goes against, this is the fine line, right? That goes, it goes against our, our universal healthcare program, but we're seeing that get adopted um, more as a proactive approach. So people don't get sick. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. So employers are saying, listen, I'm going to let everybody go, go, go to this clinic. Uh, Kelowna doesn't really have one like they do in Vancouver or Calgary, but MedCan or MedSys, there's a number of them can be. Um, and, and proactively you go there, your appointments for four hours, it's a top, it's a physical among many other things and you leave with a plan and we'll see in a year. Right. And the intention is that employers have better performing employees if they do these things. So that would be an additional benefit, um, that an employer would offer. And you mentioned TELUS. I'm curious about, I don't know. There's, I, I know TELUS is, um, I, I'm not super familiar with their healthcare offering, but they're in there. Yeah, yeah. You well, they're, they're the largest drug adjudicator in Canada. So most people don't understand that. Like, I if, don't understand that. Tell, yeah. me, tell me more so about you that. So really, when you go to the pharmacy in a, in a, in a, and you, you fill a prescription, it, it, it effectively is being adjudicated or it's, it's so there, so the formulary applied to that drug, your coinsurance, is the drug covered? Is this a reasonable and customary price for this drug? All gets applied to, to fulfilling your prescription. And that's where if the prescription's $10, they say, oh, $8 is covered too, you have to pay out of pocket. That's just a, a formula that's been applied to your drug based on some of the things we talked about earlier, the yeah. complexities of your plan. There's actually really, I mean, there's there's multiple, but there's really three core drug adjudicators in Canada, Green Shield, ESI, and TELUS. And so if you walk into, if you're with, if you're with it doesn't matter what insurer, your, your drug is typically being adjudicated by one of those three providers. Um, and, and TELUS has gone much deeper. TELUS has, TELUS has bought private medical clinics, like I, like I yeah. was referring to. Um, they've, they've, they've gone and they've bought employee family assistance programs. They bought virtual healthcare. Like TELUS is probably the biggest wholesaler of, of, of private health services in Canada. 
I, I wish that there was like an emoji over my head right now because it would be that one where its head is exploding. <laughs> um, yeah, the, it's very interesting. I mean, it's really the um, this conversation is really opening up my eyes just in terms of the opportunities you know and <clears throat> in healthcare i feel like a lot and part of the reason why i'm so jazzed about this podcast is that like it gets so frustrating always talking about what's wrong in healthcare and yet there's so much that's going on that maybe we're not exposed to in mainstream media that's actually quite progressive so what you're saying is there is opportunity for employers to support the long-term health and well-being of their employees with some of these more, I don't know, I'll call them creative. They're probably not creative for you, but like more creative applications of benefits programs. And also tech is now, whatever you want to call it, hacking um, the health system. But it sounds, and again, I know that, (laughs) I don't want to oversimplify, but it, it sounds like they're providing a really great service to fill a gap yeah, that I, right now our I, government can't figure out. I think I, – and I think this is where employers need credit. Like I'm going to – Yeah. I, but it – again, nine, 999 out of 1,000 or, or even more, I, I very rarely run into an employer that 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 is that is trying to – trying to skirt the system, right? right? Most of them sincerely- Save money on the backs of their employees. Yeah, most of them, yeah. you know, very rarely is it like, I, I, you know, this is stupid. I know I need to have this. But I mean, because it, 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 no matter what, that just resonates through your business. Yeah. So so they're few and far between. The majority and more than the, the super majority of employers that we talk to on a day-to-day basis are trying to solve these challenges on behalf of their employees. Granted, with which I, I, I don't want to, I, I don't think it's fair to say with like, selfish reasons but but the reality is because they're trying to optimize their business as best as possible and they recognize that if they promote health within their employees it's going to it's going to create a better business right and so it, we're, everyone's trying to find these gaps um and and where they go then it'll be super interesting in the next couple of years if we adopt uh, what 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 we call preferred provider networks or PPNs PPNs are very significant in the US so if you're in Southern California and you're insured through a Blue Cross, that Blue Cross would say to you, this is our PPN or preferred provider network. And again, difference. Like, from, like a mechanic to like with degree. ICBC. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah. so down there, it's like, okay, so you can go to the Eisenhower clinics they're, they're, and, and you're covered at 100% coinsurance. But if you have to walk into a clinic that's not in our network, it's covered at a lower, at a, at a lower number. Mm. There is a... French-based insurer, um, tech insurer called Allen, that has raised four billion euros, I believe, and they've moved to to five universal healthcare countries in Europe and are about to enter Canada. Okay. Under this model, that that you will participate in their networks at and get reimbursed at at you know that level, and if you want to go outside their network, it's going to drop significantly. So I'm not sure it's good. I, 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 you know, if you are willing to play within that network, you're going to have better coverages. But if you have to play outside that network, um, that, that may cause some complexities. The challenge when you look at Canada is you're talking about the largest, one of the largest land masses in the world and, and with, with, with not a very large population. Um, spread out, uh, so it doesn't work. I'm, I'm, I, at least my initial thought. Is I was that, that was it, I was thinking be your, probably it's work be their in, biggest struggle. Right? Yeah, and work in the GTA right. or Montreal or the Lower Mainland where there's like a high density yeah. population, but probably we, not <laughs> unless we got a clinic or two here in yeah. in the interior. And the other thing too is you get into those other universal healthcare countries, and and the difference in those countries versus ours right. is 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 they so it's still universal health care but it's delivered through private sectors so if you are in italy you have the ability to go to a private hospital although you have the ability 
for your under universal health care plan. It, it's the same through most of those Western countries where we don't have that. Right. Like you can't just walk up to, you know, a neurosurgeon and be like, yo, can you right. um, help me out here? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in Italy, you can. You can to a degree. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So though th- that'll be the differences that I don't know that. I mean, listen, they're they're obviously know what they're doing, but I'm curious to see how how their entrance into our marketplace changes yeah. where we go. Are there, um, so I was going to ask you about, um, we were actually, this just came up yesterday. We were just talking about these online. <laughs> I'm currently being stalked on Instagram by like these providers <laughs> it's like of Ozempic. Like, I don't know if they think, I don't know if Instagram thinks I have a problem or <laughs> like, I'm trying not to take it personally, but like, you know, I know other people are getting stalked for like birth control. <laughs> mm-hmm. I guess I'm out of that age demographic. <laughs> What's the deal with that? Because I do, I can. Can you do that? Is it covered? Um, no, you're. I mean, you're probably either in the world of scam. Yeah, or, no, they look legit. Yeah, like Felix, for example, which I know, I do know. Yep. distributes yeah, like yeah. birth control. Right. So okay, so in that scenario, you're talking about uh, like virtual pharmacies. Yeah. So those exist in Canada, um, and and really, what they're they're still saying the same thing. You, they're all they're saying is get uh, uh, one. So Felix Pocket Pills. Um, th- there's 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 a number of them across the country, and and their pitch is: listen, we don't have bricks and mortar. We're still a legit pharmacy. But because we don't have bricks and mortar, our costs are lower, so we're willing to put more money back in your pocket. Whether it's smoke and mirrors or not is to be debated. But really what they're targeting is they don't know if you take Ozempic or not, and they don't know if you take birth control or not, but they 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 pick five of their top prescribing or fulfilled scripts, and that's right. what they go out with, okay. with the hope that that then they, I'll bring my yeah. other ones yeah. there so, too. So they're online pharmacies. Um, they've struggled in Canada. They've been around for 30 years oh. um, and really have had limited success. They've had more success through the, obviously as everything shifted through the pandemic. So we did see them start to move that way. They're interesting too, right? Because you're not, if you get strep throat tomorrow, you're not going to get your antibiotic filled through an online pharmacy. You're most likely going to walk into a bricks and mortar shop and get it filled because you can't wait. So a lot of them are chasing maintenance drugs or specialty drugs. Um, and and um, the pitch is that, that whether they do lower the cost or not, they're, they're willing to put more money back in your pocket. And that's mm. typically why they, or how they go out. Mm. Very interesting. Are there any other trends, Jeff, that you're seeing? Kind of, you've highlighted a couple, and thank you. Um, some of the, you know, the tech advancements that are happening. Um, these virtual pharmacies. You know, we've talked about, um, you know, the modalities around uh, p- sort of semi-private clinic. Um, anything else that you're sort of seeing on the horizon in terms of trends? Um, in insurance or employee benefits or anything in that realm that you can share? I think we, t- we touched on a little bit earlier about this idea of flexibility. So again, if you go back to traditional plans, it was the idea that, okay, listen, it, it, you know, everyone participates, very few pull out, right? Um, so so we're all going to pay in or, or employers going to pay in and, and you're actually only going to have about 30% of people use the plan but that 30% actually makes up the cost of the 100% of employees, right? And that's why insurers, when they price things, look at things like demographics. How young is your group? Is it What's the male to female makeup? How many are single? How many are family? These are all things that come into pricing a healthcare plan. Mm-hmm. Um, the shift that's happened is this idea of like, everyone should be utilizing their benefits. And, and on the surface, you're like, it is, it's a great idea. The problem is it's driving up the cost. Right. But it's this idea of flexibility. So we see it in traditional plans where where we've moved to like what we call cafeteria flex, mostly for big, you're talking about thousands of employees. So if, if you talk to a friend that works at a big bank, typically they have that plan. And it's the idea that every two years they get to go in and say, oh, you know, for the next two years, I know I need drug coverage. And for the next two years, I'm going to want little dental because I don't like going to the dentist. And then- <laughs> Not a good strategy. No. <laughs> <laughs> the the what happens though is 
that then shifts and and they get married and they have kids and and they have to they have to reallocate their benefits in the worst case scenarios and we see this quite often actually is is Jeff, 30-year-old Jeff picked a plan when it was just Jeff and ignored it and then had kids and a wife and all these things and then they actually need something and they're still on Jeff's 30-year-old plan and they've not made the shift and that can cause some pain. Right. Um, the other place we see flexibility happening in traditional plans is this idea of like pick and choose. So so instead of saying, you know, you have a per practitioner benefit, it's very similar to, to HSAs, what employers are saying is, hey, in the practitioner world of physio, chiro, massage being the big three, naturopath four, and then you get into things like dietitian, osteopath, what employers are saying is we're not actually going to dictate to you how where you can spend your money. We're just going to give you $1,500 and you can spend it how you want it. Right. For me, I'm, I would use it for chiro or physio. Right. So all it's done is up my benefit. Right. When when my benefit was per practitioner, I didn't go source out an osteopath. I didn't even go to massage. It's like I I I I think it's my attention deficit disorder it doesn't allow me to get a massage for an hour. I just don't enjoy it. <laughs> so so I so all you got to go to one of those deep <laughs> tissue ones where you're like definitely not falling asleep. <laughs> yeah, where it hurts. Yeah. yeah. Um. So we've seen that that shift happen. But again, all it's done is is. Not all it's done. It's given the employee a better benefit, but but we just see an incurred cost um, associated with it. You know, my Cairo benefit went from five hundred dollars to fifteen hundred dollars. Like it, it that's what the flexibility. That's amazing. Done. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's positive. It is because yeah. it has positive results. Well, and it also just uh, it also as you just said recognizes that that healthcare is so individualized. Yeah. Like I, I. To your point, you know, I am in that phase of life where I like my chiropractor a lot, yeah. right? Um, and naturopath. And I max out on those benefits every year only because it's a set amount. But having a – and then, you know, there are other things like massage where I'm at the end of the year going, oh, crap. You know, I still have unused benefit, yeah. right? The cautionary tale, though, is we can only put so much – pressure on employers. I yes. And I and I would suggest we're at the end of that rope. The threshold. And so we've got to shift. We can't continue to talk about and funding a public system on their backs and having them fund the private system. And I'm biased. I'm an employer and I consult to employers more than I consult to employees. But but I but I sit on both sides of that fence and I'm telling you 10 years ago we were at a balance. Today we're not. Yeah. And and we're seeing it. The doors are closing of employers People are having to make changes. Pressure's coming. It's not. It's not that they've just lined their pockets with, with, with millions of dollars. Most employers are walking that fine line, and these costs have pushed the burden. And and that's going to be our challenge: is managing universal health care and ensuring that we don't totally sink our private sector. Well, yeah, and 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 also, I think part of maybe what I'm understanding is this this. Um, burden that has that that I'll call it a gap that employers are filling yep. um in terms of like covering the the burden of care, healthcare our universal healthcare system is like the larger organizations may have a higher threshold that they can carry but the smaller ones just can't afford to continue to operate so then you end up having right. this issue where you're losing you know the the smaller to medium size employers because they just can't compete with those larger organizations which is not good it's not good for economies it's not good for community it's not good economics yeah i mean i mean it's statistically proven that especially this province has been built and then in this valley small business has been the driving factor for for everything and mm -hmm. If we erode that, we're not we're not going to be better off. So it's a it's a fine line, right? We mm -hmm. and I would suggest today we've pushed it too far, and somehow we've got to figure out how to how to bring it back. So I'm gonna that's where I'm gonna we're gonna end there yeah. in a minute. <laughs> I was so worried. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna talk to an insurance guy for an hour for? Ha! Uh, here we are. Um, so okay, so to your point, then what? And I know you're an insurance guy, but this is like maybe just you and I talking yeah, yeah. person to person. We care about people. We care about our businesses, business community, um, 
our general communities, we're raising families, uh, we have aging parents, all these things. And the reality, as you said, is, is that we can't continue to just expect the government to do this and employers to do this. Yep. What can we do to take some personal responsibility around our need for health care? I'm sure this is a regular message, um, but you ha- besides being your own healthcare advocate, which I think is like the number one thing, is to go get educated on on these things. The, the you know understanding how programs work. It comes back to a little bit. I I, I said this Canadians, and I, I I am a Canadian. Put myself in this camp. We have got to get out of this mentality that this is a right. I agree that universal health, like no one should ever have to worry about about healthcare deliverables. But what we've got to figure out is how to participate in it and how to understand it and how to get educated about it. Um, I get it's complex. And I know that everyone's got a million things going on in their life. And, and, and you know, I always make this joke. No one says in, in high school and careers 10, like, yeah, I'm going to sell insurance when I, go, when I get older, right? Like, <laughs> said no one ever, right? Um, but, you know, as the last, hour proves this is a this is a it's complicated but it's it's manageable and it's going out and understanding and and again i'm not i'm I'm not like putting a political bent on it but understanding in depth who you're voting for and what they're about too right um i think is super key um um the more we engage the more we participate without irrational like again everybody's we just it comes back to where life is at today we've all got to just Calm down. Calm down a little bit and ask, what role can I play to make this better? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think that's, you know, what people need to do. And and again, uh, the engagement. Most employers want to want to have this, you know. I don't know if it's, it depends on the size of, of, of the business. But listen, most companies employ a human resource manager for this reason, so that you can go in and talk about these things. So instead of, you know, um, maybe going in and, and, and talking about, you know, that Debbie annoys you. Maybe start talking about you know <laughs> what I can do to help with the healthcare program. I, I mean, there's Debbie. there's <laughs> Karen. Um, oh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be my finish. It's like it's just it's we've we've got to get out of this mentality that it's handed to us yeah. and start figuring out how we participate in it. Mm-hmm. And as I'm sure it comes from everyone else, try and stay healthy. <laughs> yeah. You know that is a super key. Be proactive yeah. on it. You know. Uh, yeah, I, it's interesting that everything sort of intersects at that, at least in this converse, these conversations, it intersects at that place Mm -hmm. that, um, while there is a lot of challenges that we're facing in healthcare and healthcare funding, um, there's a lot of good things that are happening Mm -hmm. and, we have to take some personal responsibility in terms of our own health journeys, which means that I have to lift heavy weights and go for a walk <laughs> and apparently eat fiber. <laughs> I have to go for my run despite not wanting to do it, right? Yeah. So You know what? I actually, um, I listened to this other podcast and uh, he talks about how there's actually like, a better benefit to when you do something that you don't want to do, mm-hmm. but you do it anyway. Like you get, I don't even know what the, what the benefit is, some sort of like physiological benefit. I don't know if you've heard this. But. Yeah. Well, it's kind of the lesson of life, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it's kind of, when it it's is. done, when I do the things I don't want to do and they're done, I feel much better. So, yeah, it's yeah. true. Cold plunge. Oof. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us. And this has been an incredibly um, I'll say it, mind blowing conversation. Um, and I, and I really am grateful to you for helping craft this conversation because I had nowhere to start, but I really am happy with where we finished. Oh, well, we got here. So that's good. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Jack. Mm-hmm.